Uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit and we're going to talk about utilizing all those nutrients that Chris just talked about how to capture. Um, so we talked, Chris talked a little bit about manure volume produced. Uh, we're always trying to wrap our head around that particular question. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what it takes to utilize those nutrients in a crop production system, so manure sample analysis. We're going to spend a little bit of time about application and calibration. Uh, and then we're going to kind of talk about what it takes to, are we doing? Are we doing the right thing? Is it working in our crop, crop production system? Uh, there are a lot of things that affect uh, uh, nutrient concentrations in manure. Uh, the type of housing, uh, the type of bedding, the amount of bedding, pen density, uh, the season. We talked a little bit about that. You heard some of that in some other talks today. Uh, feed and feeding program, the housekeeping. Um, so, for example, uh, in our open lot systems, when we scrape open lots and we add a lot of extra soil to that manure, it kind of dilutes our manure nutrient concentration. Uh, manure storage, um, and we heard a little bit about this today. When you talk about barn management, um, scraping and packing, um, what can scrape systems and the pack systems, what that can do for uh, potential nutrient concentration or at least the uh, keeping the nutrients there, and then of course moisture content can always be a big variability. Um, I wanted to show this slide, this comes from some data out of Purdue, just to give you an idea of between different systems um, what potential nutrient losses are that also affect um, our manure concentrations. Um, so you can see from a solid system we have daily scrape and haul systems, we have manure pack systems, and then we have paved lot. In this particular case, you can see how the N, P, and K losses, nutrient losses, change between those three systems. And then I threw in a liquid system, um, because we did talk a little bit about, uh, Chris referenced the deep pits earlier. So an anaerobic deep pit, um, you can see the nutrient losses there. Um, these numbers change from farm to farm. These are just averages, and you can see that this data has been published over 12 years ago already. So it always takes a lot of time to do that kind of research. Um, we don't always see uh, 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 more recent numbers, so we kind of have to look at these numbers as some guidelines sometimes. So I'm, I need to acknowledge one of my colleagues who's sitting in the back of the room because the next few slides are actually his from his research data. Um, so I wanted to give you an idea of nutrients um, from a sampling protocol um, in some hoop and monoslope barns. Um, this work came from Russ Yukin at Iowa State University. Um, so 12 different operations, a total of 82 manure samples of uh, January of 08 through October of 2009. The samples were taken from the apron, the pack, the stockpile locations, um, and then uh, deep pack and bedded pen. So uh, the bigger, thicker manure pack that tends to stay in the barn a little bit longer, or usually at least through the feeding period. Um, the samples were analyzed for moisture and P and K, sulfur, and some of those manure samples um, were looked at for the ammonium and nitrogen content. Five of those operations out of the um, 12 were deep pack systems. Three operations uh, were cleaning um, every three to six weeks, so probably not as much manure accumulation. And then four operations cleaning every one to two weeks. Uh, 16 samples came from the apron, 21 from the deep pack samples, 28 from the bedded pan samples, 17 from those operations cleaning every two weeks, and then 17 from stockpile samples. So a nice range of location in that manure sampling experiment. Um, this is some of Russ's data that just kind of shows the average over all those 82 samples. Um, this is on an as-is basis, right? So it includes moisture. Um, so if we take a look at this, uh, we can see, uh, and I, I'm just going to point out some numbers to you because I'm going to use those later in this talk. Um, total nitrogen averaged about 19.12 pounds per ton of manure. Uh, P2O5 was a little over 11 pounds per ton, and the potassium or K2O at 12.97, about 13 pounds per ton. You can see the standard deviations. Um, so the higher the standard deviation, the greater the variability in the samples. Um, I spent my entire thesis sampling manure, and it's really hard to get a standard deviation that's low. So 
simply from the fact is, I'm sorry, the cows don't always poop where you think they're going to poop. Okay? So collecting manure samples um, and what impacts those manure samples is never very consistent. Here is a summary of that same data by the um, sampling location, so the aprons, the pens, the stockpiles, and the packs. Um, you can see in this particular case, um, we don't see a whole lot of difference here uh, between locations for total N um, or P205 in this case, um, or even the potassium for that matter. So what did Russ summarize out of his work? Um, the location of the sample in the barn or the pen, um, there was a significant effect on, um, by moisture, on moisture. Uh, but not the nutrient concentration. So the moisture content did change. Uh, packed, bedded pens, aprons, and stockpile samples, uh, nutrient cons nutrients were fairly consistent. Um, that makes life a lot easier when you're trying to use manure in a nutrient management plan. By operation, so between those farms, those 12 locations, the operation did impact the nutrient concentration. So basically what I'm saying is what I would see on my farm, I may not see on your farm. I would expect differences between locations. Um, but there was no trend uh, related to how that pack was managed. And then finally, timing or take timing of the sampling samples did affect um, concentration. So bottom line is you have to take those manure samples to know what's in them. We've had book values for many years. Um, Iowa City University actually went away from publishing their book values simply from the fact our data was old um, and we had no research funds to update those sampling procedures. Um, so we have small projects like this where we get that data and it tells us the same thing. We need to be sampling our manure. Manure sampling is not all that hard. It takes a little bit of time. The most important thing to do is be consistent in how you do it from year to year or time to time. It's going to cost you about $30 to $40 a sample. Um, it's a relatively small investment for the payback you might get on your manure system in a crop, to use in a cropping system. In the very least, you'll want to analyze it for moisture, total nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, you can have it analyzed for micronutrients. Russ had some samples done for sulfur, as you saw. You want to make sure you take good samples. You want those samples to be representative of what's in that barn or on the open lot um, or in the deep pit for that matter. Um, you should take samples at least once a year. Um, that's a good recommendation. There might be things in your management. There might be things in the weather. There might be things in what you're feeding your animals that will change over time. And you want to make sure that that's reflected in the samples you're collecting. And you want to make note of that variability by source and season, simply from the fact is, if you have a manure source that maybe has a higher nutrient concentration, it might be better to haul that one a little further down the road, where you don't normally haul manure, right? Your soil test might be lower, you might get more bang for your buck if that concentration is a little bit higher. So it's, it, it, it pays to take good notes on when you're taking your samples, how you're taking your samples, and what the difference in those samples are. Okay, we're going to shift gears just a little bit and talk about al application and calibration. Those are not my legs, but I did this very same thing two days ago. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a look here, um, so this was um, with a side slinger manure spreader at a field day we did in eastern Iowa about six or seven years ago. Um, this happens to be Leah, the watershed coordinator, and a good sport to go out and collect the samples. Um, so the slinger spreader basically was driving about here where I'm standing and spreading or throwing manure out and away. So you can see on the farthest plastic sheet, um, there's less manure than on the closest plastic sheet to the spreader in this particular case. So when we talk about calibration and application, there's lots of ways to do it. You can do it with weigh scales if you want. You can purchase commercial systems if you want. We heard about some of those on Tuesday at a field day we had. Um, or you can do it the quick and easy way. In this particular case, um, we make our plastic sheets to, I don't know, they're about four and a half by five feet. Um, so they, they represent about one two thousandth of an acre in area for that plastic sheet. 
And what happens is when you pick up the plastic sheet and weigh the manure, whatever's on the pounds in the plastic sheet is equal to tons per acre. Pretty simple stuff. So really, the excuse of I don't have time to measure how much manure I'm putting out there is kind of weak. It doesn't take long to do this. Um, you need to do it a few times. Uh, but it's really not that difficult to do. I borrowed these slides from Russ, but I happened to be there when they did this, because I, I did have get to play with this project a little bit. Um, so in this particular case, the, this producer is actually sitting in the audience today. Um, so I'm going to have you all guess really quickly, um, what is this application rate of solid beef manure out of a bedded monoslope barn versus this one? Just anybody want to guess? I know. Russ knows the answer. Harris knows the answer. He's not allowed to say. He's the producer. Anybody have a guess what this one is? I'll give you some choices. 5 tons per acre, 10 tons per acre, 20 tons per acre. I've heard all kinds of things. This one is actually 10 tons per acre. This one is five tons per acre. Now, Chris reminded me we have this big blank spot here. Um, I'm guessing, I don't remember, this was a couple of years ago, but probably would, since our flag's right here, this is the end of our plot area when the spreader took off, we probably just have, didn't have the manure engaged in the feeders to get manure out here in this area. Once again, what is that doing for your crop production, huh? This area got manure. This area didn't get very much manure. This area got a lot of manure. And then we sort of have our wheel tracks here. You can see this wheel track slips over this way. Um, or we have no manure. That's not very uniform. So from an application standpoint, um, it might not be helping our crop production system any. Um, so just some things to think about when we're out there applying manure. A little bit of this in a graphical form. Um, so in this case, this was some work done by Mark Hanna at Iowa State University. I got to collect manure samples that day, too. Man, I'm in on all the manure sample collecting. Um, so a rear delivery uh, feeder spreader. Um, in this case, the swath width was 12 and a half feet. Um, and the rate was about 35,700 pounds an acre. Um, so this was done in, yeah, longer ago than I remember, fall of 01. So the distribution basically in horizontal distance feet is, you can see, from zero over here all the way up to a little bit out there at 25 feet. And our heaviest application rate is right in the middle, right behind the spreader, right? That's sort of what we would expect to see. Um, and basically, especially if you look at a picture like that. So what can we do to manage this on the farm? Uh, to make sure, one, we're going to get the right application rate and we don't have that variability across the spread pattern. Well, sometimes we need to overlap our spread pattern, so we need to figure out how to do that. Iowa State actually has a really nice publication on how to do that. Um, but basically, if you look at the blue bars, so this might have been your first pass. So you made a pass, you came back, you turned around, you were this many feet away, you came back, turned around, went the other way, you made a pass. But in reality, what you need to do is overlap those passes so that you're evening out the tail end of that curve and the application, so the application is a little bit more uniform. So all of this needs to be done to make sure that we're getting the right rate on. Um, otherwise, we don't know what we put on and then we don't know what we have available for our nutrients um, in terms of crop production. So in terms of, al it's too bad we can't all go outside and do this today. Um, we need to know the spread pattern. We need to know the area covered in that spread pattern, so width of spread pattern. We need to know how far we're traveling in that spread pattern. We need to know the total volume of manure we have so we can figure out what we should be applying, depending on how we want to apply that manure. Um, do we want 5 tons an acre? Do we want 10 tons an acre? And we'll get to that in a little bit. Do we want 20 tons an acre? Um, we need to know how to adjust the spread pattern for a more uniform application. We need to be able to calculate how much we've applied, and we need to know how to change the amount we want to apply. What do we do to change that amount? Do we speed up with the tractor? Um, so maybe we're putting on less manure, we're driving faster, do we slow down? 
with the tractor, so maybe we're putting on more manure, we're driving slower, and we're putting more manure in less area. Um, so all those things we need to think about when we get out in the field and calibrate and do some application work. Um, so I really should let t Chris talk about this slide. Um, his, these are his comments, but you can read, you know, manure application equipment has come a long ways in the last 10 years. Um, we now see bigger trucks, we see horizontal beaters, we see vertical beaters. Um, they have a much more consistent pattern than some of our old, older manure spreading equipment. Um, it might be worth the time to investigate them, uh, especially if you want a more uniform spread pattern. Now we're going to talk about, we know what's in the manure, we've taken a sample, we know how to calibrate it, so let's figure out what it's worth and what it might do for our crop production system. So these are the numbers out of Russ's study earlier, the 19 pounds of N per ton, the 11 pounds of phosphorus per ton, and the 13 pounds of K2O per ton. So we're going to start with those numbers, just as a basis. And I changed them from a little bit from the example in the uh, proceedings. Um, we know that for beef manure, for our solid beef manure systems, that all, not all of our nitrogen is available the first year. Chris alluded to this in the first couple of slides. Um, our nitrogen is in the organic form um, in beef manure, or at least a higher percentage of it's in the organic form. It takes time for that material to mineralize or become available for plant uptake. So Iowa State's recommendations, based on some research done the last few years at Iowa State, is that our N availability for first year beef manure and dairy manure is probably somewhere between 30 and 40 percent. So that means in that first year we've applied that manure, only about 30 percent of that N is going to be available for that crop growth. It doesn't mean the rest of it disappeared, the other 60 percent. We'd have to look at year two and year three, and you may say, okay, Angie, if you're using 30% and you use 10%, there's 40%, here's 45%, what happened to the other 55% of the end? Usually what happens is it does become tied up in that organic pool in the soil, so it's not like it's leached or it's, made, it's disappeared. Um, it may become available to plant production over time, and it may just become part of that soil organic uh, matter pool. Um, phosphorus, in this case, this recommendation is 100% available for phosphorus um, and 100% available for K. So in my next example, I only use 30% available for my, for my nitrogen. So when I multiplied my 19 pounds of N times 30%, I actually come up with 5.7 pounds. I rounded it up to 6 pounds. And I just took some fertilizer prices from earlier this year. So I have six pounds of nitrogen per ton times 50 cents a pound worth three dollars. My phosphorus is 100% available, so all 11 pounds, so to speak, are available. At 60 cents a pound is six dollars and sixty cents. My potassium is all available, 100%. Um, 13 pounds times 50 cents a pound, and you can very easily plug in your own local commercial fertilizer prices. It's very easy to do this. We add it up, and our manure, in this particular case. If all the nutrients are needed for crop production, it's worth about $16.10 a ton. Now, I want to go through this chart really quickly, because I know lunch is calling, um, and just give you some examples of how I did this. Because I didn't do it like the ag engineers do it, I did it like the agronomist thinks. Um, so, we took our first year available numbers, the ones I just showed you, the 6, 11, and 13 for the N, P, and K. And then, because I'm a little bit like Rick, I need to think in bigger numbers, full numbers, I actually thought about, well, okay, if I was going to put on 15 tons of manure, I'm not going to calibrate, I don't know what's in my manure, manure I'm kind of, well, I know what's in my manure, but I'm going to put on 15 tons an acre, that's 90 pounds of N per acre, 165 pounds, I'm sorry, 90 pounds, 165 pounds of P205, 195 pounds of K2O. Okay? Now, in Iowa, we use our um, MRTN calculator for uh, evaluating uh, nitrogen, to, um, corn, uh, nitrogen to corn price ratio to see where we're going to get our most bang for our buck. And in this case, for 200 bushel of corn, um, and I figured at $800 a ton for anhydrous, and when I drove by the co-op the other day, the corn was $440, um, I need 183 pounds of N to grow my 200 bushels of corn. This is corn following corn. 
I need 75 pounds of P2O5, I need 60 pounds of K2O. That comes right out of our soil fertility recommendations. So if I was going to do this on a nitrogen-based rate, if I need 183 pounds of N per acre to grow my 200 bushel corn crop, I know in 15 tons there's 90 pounds, I'm going to have to double this, right, to get about 180 pounds, right, so we're up to 30 tons. So at a 30 ton per acre basis on my nitrogen based rate, where does that leave me with the P and K? Well, in this case, I have to double the numbers, so I'm doubling the 165, so I have 330 pounds minus the 75 pounds I need for the corn that year, leaves me with 255 pounds of phosphorus that I didn't really need for that crop production system. Now, does this mean it's an environmental risk? No. Does it mean I could have used that phosphorus maybe somewhere else? Yes. Um, and the same with the potassium. In this case, I've over applied my potassium by 330 pounds when I applied on an N-based rate. If I thought about doing this on a P-based rate, now I need to get to that 75 pounds of P2O5 for my 200 bushel corn. So in this case, I need 6.8 tons per acre of manure, okay? And that leaves me putting on 40.8 pounds of N and 88.4 pounds of K2O. So I've still exceeded my potassium needs, not nearly as bad as I did here, um, but I'm way short on my end if I need 183 pounds. I've only got 40 pounds on. So a lot of producers, um, especially in the world of beef manure, uh, use a phosphorus-based rate, or at least they lower their application rate. Um, and what they gain by doing that is you can get manure over a few more acres, um, and they're going to supplement that with commercial fertilizer, because we know, as we've heard from Chris, as I showed earlier, only about 30% of that N is available, so we know that that N takes time to convert in the soil. Um, and so our commercial fertilizer application is going to help us out with a little bit with that kickstart we kind of need in the spring for our crop production. So there are a lot of people that do this kind of application um, by using a lower application rate and not meeting the nitrogen based rate. So what happens when we do that? If we apply on that N based rate, we're going to meet that N and need, right? But we're going to over apply the phosphorus and potassium most likely, kind of depends on where your samples shake out. Um, and it's going to limit the value of that P and K if we didn't need it. Now, if our soil tests are optimum or lower and we need that P and K, it might not, we might not lose as much value. But if our soil tests are high for P and K and we didn't need it, then that P and K is probably not worth a whole lot to us. And then all of a sudden our manure is not worth $16.10 a ton. Um, if we apply on that P base rate, to optimize the phosphorus, we're going to require that lower application rate. It's going to require some supplemental N that can make up for that whole mineralization process every year. Um, and it might allow us to cover a few more acres. It takes a lot of time to do this, but once you get in the habit of doing this, we need a feedback loop to see if it's working. And I think this is, in my opinion, this is where a, a lot of us as extension educators sort of fail. Um, and it's something you all don't do, not because you don't want to do it, it's because you're busy feeding cattle and this is not your top priority. Um, we need to keep good sampling records. Like I said before, we need to know which manure source works best where, which location. If we have a more nutrient-dense product, maybe we need to be hauling that a little further down the road. We need to calibrate so we know what's coming on. We can't just eyeball it. Um, we need to track yield. Maybe we put manure out and maybe we don't put any manure out on the same field to see what that manure did for our crop production or we pair, compare it to a commercial fertilizer source. We need to be cognizant of what the weather does to our manure sources once we land apply them. Um, so we have a lot of people, you know, in Iowa we have a lot of liquid swine manure and we put it on in the fall. And last year, well last fall wasn't all that wet, Last spring, the spring was very wet, and we did lose a lot of our nitrogen sources. So it is possible to lose our nitrogen. We all know it happens, so we need to think about what happens if my crop system does not respond the way I thought it should by using manure. Was it the weather? Did we have extra rainfall? What happened? Maybe I didn't get the right radon. We need to 
go back and kind of look at all of this. And then every year we sort of need to reassess that whole plan and make adjustments. Because our manure samples will change a little bit over time. Um, other things will change a little bit over time. So we should really be thinking about doing this every year. Um, so Chris wants to talk about this slide. Oh, I, I grew up in uh, just north here a bit, and uh, my dad said there's only two seasons in the year. There's, uh, there's winter, and winter is coming. So fortunately, we're still in the winter 